Hi there. I'm Nutrix, and today I was asking myself what makes audio sampling vintage audio sampling. When we talk about vintage sample or vintage samplers, what is it that we talk about? Now, for me, I find it funny and interesting because I grew up and I started to make music as samplers were getting more and more interesting. I think I bought my first synthesizer and sampler in the early 90s, and the whole 90s was basically digital audio evolution, uh, revolution. Uh, so how do we today look back on those devices and talk about vintage sound? For that, I need to start with the notion of what is sample? This is a crash course on digital audio, sample for sampling. At the same time, it's all the notion you need to understand to be able to control correctly lo-fi plugins when we talk about digital lo-fi or lo-fi uh, software synthesizers where or samplers where you can control values of digital audio. I'm not talking about tape-based lo-fi, but I'm talking about digital audio lo-fi. Let's start with what is sampling to understand how it works. The act of sampling, it's digital recording, it's recording analog sound into a digital format. So you're basically taking a continuous signal, let's say a sine wave, and you're capturing the sine wave as snapshots of the sound. Each picture of the sound describe the sound it's a little bit like movies, where moving is also called moving pictures, where we basically have many pictures, one after the other, playing fast, so we don't see the movement. But when we stop, we just see one picture. Same thing with sound. Digital audio is taking a lot of pictures of the sound and playing them back fast enough that we hear a continuous sound where it's not. It's a list of specific snapshots. Uh, and then you can store it, change it, modify it, and then play it back. All the controls of over playing back with digital audio as became what we now call sampling, which is much more than just the action of recording. It includes also the entire artistic creation of doing something else with these recordings. When you sample something, you're going to take these snapshots. And the question is, how many snapshots do you need so it sounds like the original? Sampling rate. So how many snapshots per second do we take? It's a sample per second. It's called Hertz or kilohertz if you go over a thousand Hertz. In this case, we do. The logic is simple. If you have more samples, if you have more snapshots, you will have much more of a shape that is closer to the original curve of the analog sound that you're recording. Nyquist was one of the searcher that came up with the notion that to be able to record up to the frequency that you need to record, you need at least to be twice as fast. And the logic is simple. So the sine wave is oscillating. If you need to record a frequency that runs at 10,000 Hertz, so you need at least a minimum, one value at the top, one value at the bottom. So you'll know what frequency, what speed, what note that was playing. But because you only have two values, you're exactly the double of the movement. You only pick the top and the bottom. When you recreate the wave, it's going to be on, off. There's not, no slope, no shape whatsoever, which is not the natural thing that is usually happening. So you're going to able, be able to record the frequency, but the timbre of the frequency, the shape of it, will not be accurate because it won't be the right shape. It's supposed to be curved and it's not it's going to be squared. You have 44.1 kilohertz, you have 48 kilohertz, you have 88.2 kilohertz, you have 96 kilohertz, 192 kilohertz, you have different types of speed. Basically, you understand that if you add 96 kilohertz, you have a lot more of these samples happening in time, so your curve would be even more precise than the one that runs at 44. That's kind of the obvious logic. Of course, 96 means that at 96 kilohertz, you, you're sampling a lot more information per second. So the space 
it will take to store that information will be bigger. So that also is another question for hardware and software saying, okay, where do I put this? Do I have this, the memory for that? It means that basically if you're going lower in sampling rate, you're actually having a problem in capturing the high end. So what you're doing, you're cutting the whole the high frequencies. But the Nyquist theory explains something that is really interesting is that, let's say, let's say you record at the sampling rate of 20 kilohertz. So it means that the highest frequency you should be able to record to capture correctly is 10 kilohertz of frequency. And you know that in your, let's say, drum beat, there's frequencies over 10, it goes up to 20. So from 10 to 20, all the frequencies are there. If you don't have any filter at the input of, in your analog to digital converter, where it, it places the information somewhere on one of your samples, if you're higher than the frequency that you can record, it will receive the information, but the result that you'll have is gonna be flipped over. So if you were at 10 as your maximum, because you're recording at 20, kilohertz, that's a recording sampling rate. If you have a sound that plays at 11 kilohertz instead of 10, or one kilohertz higher than your 10, it will appear at nine. It's just gonna be flipped over. So you're gonna have, if you have something playing at 12 or 15, 15 will appear at five. It's gonna be minus five instead of plus five. So this is really interesting. Well, it's not when you're looking for accurate recording, but it's interesting as a creative process because you have new content that appears that wasn't there before. It's called aliasing. So it's a problem what you're looking for is capturing a good guitar sound so you want it to play back, but it's a godsend when you're doing something that is just creative and you're looking for having a distortion that nobody ever heard before because it creates stuff that is just not there. It flips over the frequency. So this is really interesting. If I bring down the sampling rate, now I'm playing at 44.1. So if I'm at six right now, seven, remember it's half. So what we hear is half the frequency. So it goes up to, if I'm at six, eight, let's say I'm gonna stop, let's say six. At six, the higher frequency that I'm hearing, actually I'm recording is three, but I have these weird sound in it. It's because I'm using a low quality analog to digital converter. So it means that right now there is no filter for cutting everything over three kilohertz. And then what we hear is the other frequency over three that are being flipped over aliasing. Now, if I bring the quality higher, you basically now have your filter cutting the information coming in. So it, mo it sounds more like a muffled sound than if you go like this because you, as you go down the sampling rate you're cutting the frequencies still have that digital noise to it and an analog to digital converter you have the input stage when you receive the signal you have the anti-aliasing filter well the job is to remove the frequency that are higher than the, fre the higher frequency you should be able to record so the frequency that is half the speed of your uh, sample rate. In all the samplers today, and all I would say the modern samplers since early 2000, most of them, when you select the sampling rate, the filter moves with it automatically, and you don't have any control over that. It just goes with it. The early samplers, the Mirage, the uh, Emus, and the MPCs, sometimes, depending on the model, you could control separately the filter before sampling. So the input filter that was to get rid of the aliasing, it could be open instead of closed if you wanted to. So you could say, I want to have these this weird sound coming in. I want to have these frequencies to flip and be recorded like that. That was possible. That's part of the sound of the vintage samplers because it's something that you don't see in modern samplers outside of adding a plugin to create that sound. But it was part of the recording. So then your sample was made with this all the time. It was recorded and fixed with that after that. Now, every one of these snapshots, every one of these samples of your sound has a bit 
definition. When we say it's 24-bit, 8-bit, 12-bit, whatever it is, bit depth is basically how many bits you're using, how many words of vocabulary the system has to describe the sound at that moment in time compared to the zero value of neutral sound. So how much distance amplitude it is from zero, top or bottom. So if you have an 8-bit system, you're going to have 566 words of description. So it gives you 48 dBs of dynamic range, which is really not a lot. So you're going to hear noise really rapidly. The background noise will be obvious. So older system, more noisy, basically. But it's not a noise like a tape noise. It's a digital noise. You'll hear it's different. 12-bit, well, you have 72 dBs, which is a lot more. Still, when you get into subtle passages or subtle instruments, like instruments like uh, strings or wind instruments where you have very loud and very soft way of playing it, you might, again, lose it into the noise it's possible. 16 bits, the CD quality that we know, it's 65,000 and some words of description for the sound. So you have a dynamic range of 96 dBs. Now, 24 bits also exist and 32 floating point also, but 32 floating point, just, just to be quick about that, it's mostly something we see as internal calculation for DAWs, for example. So when you're doing all your mixing and editing, you're in 32 bits for floating point. So it means you have a lot of edge room before you actually start to distort because you're playing with too much stuff. And then you bring it down to 24 at the playback or the save when you bounce the track or 16 when you finish your, your file, which is fine. 24 bit, you have 16 million position for the words, 144 dBs of dynamic range. Now, if I'll play now with the bits, is I've got, I've got 16 bits right now. If I play like that, listen with headphones. When you have the tail of different sounds, you hear that. Now it's obvious, but that's very low. Now, if I change this to a... You hear the noise. You hear the background noise. If I bring it down, the noise overtakes the sound. I find that really interesting. But that's not precise recording. That's not accurate at all. So that's the noise of an 8-bit system because you had 48 dBs of dynamic range and the guitar has more than that. So you're bringing up the noise floor basically and then you hear it. It's just too loud. It's part of the sound. If I have more words to describe it, it just goes away. Still at 12, you, you're hearing it still. And as it goes away to 16, it's too far away to be a problem anymore. This was really important. When all these different samplers came out in the 80s and 90s, the limits of the technology used at that time were basically the fact that you didn't have all the components or the affordability of the components. So having good uh, analog to digital converters, having good sampling rate, an accurate sampling rate, that the sampling rate stays the same speed. Now, some of it doesn't. So when you're recording, actually, all the samples are not exactly the same size. When you play back, they're not exactly the same size. So it changes, it colors the sound. And part of it is part of that sound and say it's lo-fi. It's, yeah, because the quality, the parts that we had were not up to par to high-end quality that today we have. Because when we were looking to sell at a, an affordable price, price was always a challenge. And... It meant that you had to do a choice on how much memory you want to put in. RAM memory cost a lot at the time. 
length of the sample. So that's why early samplers just uh, took a little part and looped it, and then you would play it. It's part also of the sound. The process that you had existing in the crossfade looping and stretching and all that stuff gave you all these different textures to change the sound. So a lot of these, what we call vintage sampling sound today, is a combination of all of that hardware, analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter, how efficient did they have the anti-aliasing filter that moves with the frequency rate or not, the fact that the sampling rate has these options or not, how many bits that you had to use, 8, 12, 16, 24, and then all the internal process to make the sound more musical, time stretch it, uh, crossfade the input, the loop it, all that stuff. It's part of the, what the sound is because it all the time you process these, it's also part of the sound of it. It's just a cool time to be in music, digital music today because you have all the options today. You want to make it noisy, you can. You want to make it nice, you can. You want to make it move between nice to noisy, you can. It's just entirely flexible. I hope this is useful. I hope that this helps you understand more of the you know, parameters that you have in your lo-fi digital plugin or synthesizer and helps you get to the result that you want more quickly. That's it. Stay safe, make more music, and see you soon. Cheers.